Hey guys, it's good to see you again as we're coming to our midweek Bible study here at Trenton Street Baptist Church. We've been studying the book of Daniel. Uh, I'm glad you're with us today. I hope you dig in, open up your Bibles. Let's get started and have a wonderful time this next installment in the book of Daniel. Well, one of the things that uh, my wife and I like to do is, is go on date night. And we usually take Thursday nights and we get away. We, we leave the kids in charge of the house. Uh, we go out to eat dinner or we uh, would go to a movie whenever that was possible in the world that we live in. Uh, but we would just take that time to, to come apart and, and just let the Lord enrich our marriage. But one of the things that we do is when we leave the kids in charge, we always tell them, uh, you know, won't you pick up the house? Won't you use this time to do your chores? And and this will be this will be your chore time. And then this weekend we can have some free time. Well, every so often we'll come back and we'll walk through the doors, and they have not done their chores, and they haven't picked up the house, and the dishes are still this, and and they're just hanging out and they're playing games. And I can see the look in Angie's eyes, and guys, I can just see the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> which brings me to the title of this study, The Handwriting on the Wall. Has there ever been that time in your life whenever you could just sense the imminent judgment from someone that was about to come or the, the imminent thing that was about to happen? You, and you just use that phrase. You say, I can see the handwriting on the wall. Well, let me show you where we got that from all the way back in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, in this new era in the life of Daniel, whenever a new king had come to power in Babylon, and God was once again going to use him in a very powerful and mighty way. But there was a lot of things that happened in this kingdom, this Babylonian kingdom. And one of the things that you see as you look back through the history of the rise and the fall of kings is just the corrupt nature of the political landscape of what was going on in, in Babylon. And you see that under Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon grew to one of the greatest empires the world has ever known. But when he died... It started to disintegrate little by little. And with different leaders coming to power, then one would be assassinated, another one would come to power. They would reign for sometimes as short as two months. Uh, and then others would reign for several years. And then they would be assassinated all the way down till we get to chapter 5 of Daniel with Belshazzar was ruling over uh, the kingdom of Babylon when we pick up this story in chapter 5. And in this scripture... Uh, this new king that's sitting upon the throne in Babylon was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. You may see the word father in just a minute, but in the Bible a lot of times uh, that was just connecting them to uh, the generations past by calling them father. It was sort of a generic term, but he was actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And there were probably about 2,000 people present in this, this banquet that he's setting up in just a minute. Uh, to just pretty much show off, and that's what he's doing. So there's new king, new power, new pride. And he's showing off, so he throws this great banquet, and he does so, and when he, it just, it's the epitome of pride, and, and we're going to get to see how God intervenes in this and, and what he does. But let's take a look at verses 1 through 4 and see how God was provoked. God was provoked. In verse 1 through 4 it says this, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. So as you take a look at this passage, you see why God is provoked in just a moment. Uh, Belshazzar sets up this, this great banquet. He invites influential people. He wants to impress them. So he actually orders that they would go and get some of the articles that they had taken from the temple that was in Jerusalem whenever uh, the Babylonian Empire had destroyed Jerusalem in years prior. So he wants to, to just flaunt 
that this empire had taken over and, and ruled over the God of the Jewish people. And as he does this, um, you know, he's, he's flaunting not only the empire's power, but he's also puffing himself up and trying to make himself look good in the eyes of others. And he's just, he's reminiscing uh, of what God had done, or I'm sorry, what uh, the empire had done over the God of Israel. And as he's doing that, he, he's taking on some of the same characteristics as his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar when we saw him in the opening chapters of just this, just full of pride and, and arrogance. And there's one thing that we can read from this and understand is power can very easily corrupt us. Maybe we've been elevated in a position at work. Uh, maybe somehow we've just been given a new platform and there's a lot more people listening to us and giving us their attention. Whatever the case may be, if we're not careful, power can pollute us. And we see that a lot in uh, Hollywood when people rise to, to fame uh, very quickly and early on in age. And we see how that can corrupt and, and really just devastate their lives. And here's this uh, ruler over, over Babylon exhibiting the characteristics of his grandfather and that he is just full of pride. And one of the things that we're going to understand is God is not mocked forever. And we can provoke him with our actions. And I, I believe as we look out in the world today, we see a lot of pagan rulers. We see a lot of people who feel as if they're self-made men and self-made women and, and that everything has come out of their own ingenuity and their own power and their own strength. And they are praising the God of themselves. And as, we, as they do that, they're provoking God to, to anger. Because God's the one that put the breath of life in us. God was the one that put them in authority. If you have power, you have influence, and you have resources in your life, uh, know that that comes from God and understand that He's the one that put people in place and He gave the breath of life for them to even get to the place that they are. The Bible even specifically points out that He created government and He puts people in rulership for a specific purpose and to, uh, for the good of the people. And they can abuse that power or they can use that power for God's glory. Here... Uh, this king, once again, was polluted by power. He begins to praise the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. You say, well, that sounds silly. I don't think anybody would do something like that today. Well, I believe there are still cultures that bow down to idols and statues and have very traditional views of uh, deities. But I think in, even in America, don't you see people bowing down to the god of the almighty dollar and, and power and prestige and influence and people are praising that it was either their resources or it's money that's going to bring us security and hope. It's our military that's going to take care of us and, and protect us. It's the scientists that are going to be able to come up with um, vaccines and things that's really going to fix all of our problems. We're not careful. We can praise the gods of the material world, praise the gods of the physical world, and not look to the one true and living God for our hope and give Him the credit and the praise that's glory uh, that's due to His name, and the glory that's due to His name. If we're not careful, we can provoke God to wrath with the things that we praise and lift up in our life. I've said it once before, I think that we can look at possessions and, and resources and even money in uh, one of two unhealthy ways. We can be unhealthy savers or unhealthy spenders. And the unhealthy spenders believe that we just get, 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 and that's going to bring me happiness, it's going to bring me peace. The unhealthy savers believe I can just put it all back and have a nest egg that that's where my security and that's where my hope is. And so we make gods out of material and, and physical things uh, no different than the king of this Babylonian empire did that provoked God to anger. So God was provoked and he's not going to be mocked forever. So he's not going to let this go. And you say, well, why does God allow pagan kings and rulers and other nations and, and it's sometimes even in our nation that are not following God, why does he allow certain ones to come to power and why does he let them away and get away with all these evil things that they're doing? Well, here's one of the answers to that. He's not going to do that forever. It's not going to be that way forever. He is being provoked by what's taking place and he's not laughing. He's not turning a blind eye. It's grieving his heart. And they're building up wrath for a day of judgment. And there will be a day of judgment that's coming, and much as we can see here in just a moment. So we're going to see, uh, number two, that God is present. Not only is He provoked, 
but he's also present during these times. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, In the same hour the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Wow, what a horrifying experience. He's sitting here in this banquet just gloating over what he thinks are his accomplishments. He's getting drunk. He's making poor decisions, which usually go hand in hand. And as he's doing this, he makes a few bad judgment calls. And this just so happens to be the day that God had appointed where judgment was going to fall on the empire of Babylon. And he sees this handwriting on the wall. Literally, God in his, uh, his power and in his, his glory shows up in a supernatural way. And there's a special manifestation of God here. And this hand just begins to write on the wall. And it's terrifying. And you can imagine the, the king, the, the picture that the scriptures paint here is that his knees are knocking. I mean, he is terrified. This is not some, well, maybe that's what that was incident. No, it was very clear to him that something strange was happening, something that was supernatural out of this world, and it wasn't pleasant, and he was scared to death. And God, God is present. So what I want you to hear from this is as you read this passage and you think about the evil rulers that are in the world today, and, and you can maybe even turn inward and think about the evil things that we do as human beings. And you say, where is God in all of this? Well, I want to tell you, He's right there. He's right there. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. And He's working. He's pouring out um, judgment when the time is right, chastisement when the time is right, encouragement. He's drawing people away from sin. He is working. He is present, even in the midst of that. Uh, you know, the Bible says that we're without excuse, that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen in the things that's created. So we can look in creation and know that there's a God of right and wrong, a God of order. He's present even in the attributes and the revelation of creation. Um, he's present here in a very special way as He manifests Himself you say, well, Tony, if he would do that now, maybe people would straighten up. Well, I believe we can see very clearly from Scripture that Jesus uh, was the personification of all of the law and all of the prophets, and people still didn't turn to faith, not all of them, uh, turned to faith even with Jesus walking on planet Earth. Uh, so we see that people have, they have a witness. Also, we see that uh, when the rich man and Lazarus uh, the parable and the story about that, uh, I'm sorry, not the parable, but the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, we look at, and we see that uh, whenever the rich man was in Hades, he looks back up and he's talking to Abraham and he says, send someone back to my brothers that they don't come to this horrible place. And what does he say? He said they have the Moses and the prophets and they have the law to, to teach them. If they don't believe that, they're not even going to believe if some supernatural manifestation takes place. So, we're without excuse today to say, well, if I saw supernatural handwriting on the wall, then I would probably turn to, well, you have Scripture, you have creation, you have Jesus Christ who is the revelation of God. You have all these things pointing you to the truth. You have a conscience inside of you that God built there to teach you right from wrong. We have so many things. We are without excuse. Uh, we don't need some supernatural manifestation to, to teach us right from wrong. God is present with us. He showed us that in so many ways, and He was here. And He is now working in our world today, even in the midst of pagan rulers, in the midst of evil. The handwriting is on the wall. He has revealed it in Scripture that He is going to judge right and wrong. There is a place appointed uh, for us to be for eternity. For those that are followers of Christ, that place in the Bible is called heaven. For those that reject Christ and go in their own way, there's a place called hell. And He has told us that. He has revealed that to us. He's preached that to us. Uh, we've, we, we have the understanding that, uh, God, there is a handwriting already on the wall from reading God's Word and hearing uh, God's Word spoken and preached. So God is present. Lastly, God is 
preparing. Look at verses 7 through 12. And we see how God's preparing beforehand the things that He wants us to walk in as His servants, but also judgment for the evil as well. It says, The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, uh, your father the king made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. So God is preparing beforehand what He's prepared for us. And you think about how He was working in this kingdom. He was working in this empire. He was also working in the life of Daniel. You remember the credentials that Daniel had in the beginning chapters, that he had uh, been beside King Nebuchadnezzar whenever he had those dreams. and No one in the land could interpret them. Well, here comes a very similar situation, and they know where to go. And I love that, that God's preparing His people for such a time as this. And one of the incredible things is we look out into our world and sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the devastation and the evil and difficult situations and we sometimes wring our hands or we want to give up. But God's saying, I've prepared you for this. I have made you for such a time as this. I've given you my truth. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You have wisdom. You have me with you. You're prepared for this. Don't be afraid. And don't cower and don't back down, but, but be like Daniel. Be prepared and be ready because he says, I, I'm using you for this. So uh, there's a crisis that comes into your family. Guess what? God has prepared you for such a time as this that you could engage, that you could do something about it. They, they didn't know where to look in all the kingdom, and all of a sudden the queen comes up and she says, Oh, yeah, I remember a man that can probably do something about this, and it's Daniel. You know what's amazing to me is sometimes you have lost friends or those that are far from God and they find themselves in situations where uh, they're just they're living the way they want to live and, and sometimes they come in, they're boastful about it and sometimes they, they seem so happy and they seem like they're on top of the world and they're just walking away from God and, and maybe even they ridicule you at times and mock God. But it's amazing when crisis happens, when something difficult happens in their lives. Sometimes they will turn to a godly person and they will ask questions or they will seek counsel or they will want wisdom. They might not even recognize what's going on, but they know that there's something in you. There's something different. God has prepared you for that. He's put you in places in your family life, in your work life, with your grandkids, with your kids, whatever the case may be. People, that you, They will know that there's something about you. See, God has prepared us for that. That's why He's been pouring out truth, and that's why He equipped you to do the work of the ministry, because all the things around you are not coincidental, and He's put you in the place that He's put you in to prepare you uh, to be used and to bring Him glory. So this king didn't know that. He was just doing his thing. God was preparing Daniel behind the scenes to work uh, on the scene of mankind, the scene of history here in a very special way. He was also preparing judgment for this pagan king and this pagan empire. So know that God is working. Let me leave you with a few life principles before we finish. Number one, make no mistake, God will not be mocked forever. Principle number one, God will not be mocked forever. It may look like everyone's getting away with walking away and rejecting God but God is not mocked forever. And understand that in your own life today. 
that you may be walking away from God, you may be running 100 mile an hour thinking, no one knows, I'm getting away with this scot-free, but God is not mocked forever. There will be a day of reckoning. You can turn now, humble yourself, be forgiven, walk towards God, or you can be like this pagan king and let it take you farther and farther away from God to where you stand at the pinnacle of pride and accept the judgment hand of God. Number two, God's omnipresence is both comforting and convicting. His omnipresence is both comforting and convicting. It's comforting to know that Jesus is with you uh, when you're walking with Him and you're doing right and you're walking in the, in the light of His Word, but it's also very convicting to know that Jesus is with you and sees everything you say, sees everything you think, and one day you're going to have to be accountable for that. But uh, just know that he's, He is omnipresent. and he, He's out there around everyone else in the world as well. Number three, God is preparing judgment for evil and His servants for good. He's preparing judgment for evil and His servants for good. So think about that as you look out in your world today and as you look at your world personally, that God is preparing you to do incredible things. And be ready whenever the time comes for you to stand and be like Daniel. Let's see what happens next week with Daniel. What's going to happen when the queen goes and gets Daniel and brings him back to this king? Let's tune in next week and finish this story together. But let me pray with you before we finish. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We ask you to bless. Bless those that are at home right now watching. God, that you would just let them feel your presence, know that you are with them right there where they are, wherever they're listening to this. If it's at home, it's at a coffee shop or a hospital, I'm not so sure where people are going to be. But Father, you are there. We've learned from this passage that you're there, even when we, we are not aware of it. So let them know in a special way, Lord, that you're there with them. Fill them with your presence, with your power. God, help us to step up to the plate knowing that you have prepared us as your people for such a time as this that we live in, that we could bring you glory somehow in some way. God, I love you and I thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.